All right, we are live. Dr. Davis, do you want me? I have 358. Do you want to, do you want to wait? Or I have four o'clock. You have four o'clock? All right, yeah, let's, four get, let's, well. let's go with Dr. Nutt's uh, and Mrs. Edwards' clock. All right, I would like to call the uh, regular uh, study session to order for the Henry County Board of Education on April 20th, uh, 2020, and I'll turn it over to our superintendent for her welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board and the Henry County community. Uh, it is with uh, great honor that I uh, kick off this April board meeting uh, with a, a moment of welcome. You know, interestingly enough, our last board meeting happened to be on March 9th of 2020. And wow, what a difference uh, a month of board meetings can make. And I uh, just reflect on these last five weeks that our community has experienced uh, together and truly acknowledge that Henry County is no better place to live and to learn. And the role that public education plays as the thread that holds the fabric of communities together is never more obvious. And certainly there is important business before the board tonight, but there are important people in our community that have made continuing to function, operate, and thrive as a school system possible. Uh, I, I think I want to start by acknowledging that the role that the Board of Education has played, the work that you have done to develop, design, and live by a unified governance model is the reason our community can coherently and with coordination approach such, such a trying time. Because you have worked to be a stabilizing element to our organization and our community. It is your heavy lifting hard work that led into March that has allowed us to make strong, quick decisions and to take action on behalf of students to continue to learn at high levels. I just wanna applaud you and thank you for your governance during this season and acknowledge that the, that the superintendent board governance team is surely being tested and I'm proud to say that we are thriving uh, during these, these challenging circumstances. But we wouldn't be thriving without an exceptional team of 6,000 employees, amazing 43,000 children and their families, and an amazing partnership that has emerged um, as we take learning into homes and services into the community throughout our entire district. Um, of course, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge my gratitude to be a part of such an amazing uh, team of employees. It, it does happen to be difficult to call out any one job family that's, uh, that's just really uh, influencing the season more than another because every single aspect of our community of, of educators has played a vital role. And, um, and because of, of, a, of a team working together on behalf of, of children, um, we're able to do some great things. Um, but it is, uh, it does happen to be uh, National Teacher Appreciation Week here on the horizon. And so, um, you know, what a, a moment in time where I think we're going to have to send uh, teacher appreciation uh, recognition into each of our families' homes as, uh, as parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts and grandparents have all become teachers alongside our teachers. But our teachers have turned their kitchens into classrooms overnight, and there is no finer collection of educators on the planet than those that serve and, uh, and teach here in Henry County. Um, and ironically, right at the same time, it happens to be National School uh, Nutrition Staff Appreciation Week. And if you think about the role that our food and nutrition employees are playing during this time, feeding tens of thousands of children every day, keeping our kitchens open at six of our schools with every one of our schools, food and nutrition staff uh, weaving their way into serving in those environments. Um, could you just imagine this opportunity to celebrate the role that food and nutrition employees play in not only our community, but communities across this country? And wouldn't you believe it, that it's also School Nurse Appreciation Week. And if you think about the role that the medical profession has played in the lives of communities, it's certainly uh, profoundly inspiring. And we know medical professionals start right here in our school system too. And so when I think about uh, our clinic aides and our nursing professionals and the role that they have played to keep the health and welfare of our children at the forefront of their work, uh, what an op opportunity to celebrate them. 
And then finally, April is National School Library Month. And as we realize just how precious resources are in the hands of our children, uh, we recognize the role that media specialists and library professionals play in making that possible. And before I turn it over to you, Mr. Hinton, for the business of the meeting, I also want to acknowledge that partnerships in the community could not be stronger and the opportunity to uh, see that come to fruition over spring break was pretty remarkable. Um, David Newman and Operation Lunchbox partnered with Henry County Schools and was funded by the Chris Tucker Foundation and many, many restaurants in our community donated uh, to serve food at each of our uh, meal service sites. Uh, throughout our spring break. I believe we we're only one of the only districts in the region able to provide food service over spring break. And it's because of prominent partnerships like Operation Lunchbox and the Chris Tucker Foundation. And Operation Lunchbox does continue to do uh, delivery of food service for students who cannot access our curbside pickup. I want to recognize Story on the Square and several community sponsors that uh, 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 organized a successful book giveaway on Friday, April 17th, where over 500 books were donated in less than an hour from Story on the Square. And then you may have already caught this on the news, but thanks to the Atlanta Community Food Bank and Atlanta Motor Speedway, they partnered with Hampton Elementary School and provided food for over 3,000 people at their latest um, market on Friday, April 17th. And that's a, a homegrown uh, uh, approach to serving the community that was really led by, um, by uh, Brian Kiefer, the principal at Hampton Elementary and the, and the school community there. I bring this all to say that uh, you don't have strong communities in hard times if you don't have strong communities all the time. Uh, these last few weeks have been a reflection of how strong the Henry County community is and the role that public education plays in its strength. I wanna turn the credit to the Board of Education who operates with such vision and a commitment to uh, stability and uh, your work to make sure that we can make fast decisions and, and keep students and families at the center of our work has never been more pre um, prominent. Uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes what I have prepared. I turn it back over to you. Thank you for that welcome, Dr. Davis. We'll now move to the next section of our agenda, which is uh, section C, our informational items for tonight in our study session. C1 uh, is our COVID-19 academic and operational continuity briefing. Uh, Dr. Davis. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'd like to take a moment and uh, actually bring informational item C1 to your attention uh, myself. And uh, what you can see on the screen is also a document that will be made publicly available on our website. It really is our uh, attempt to provide a transparent communication piece to the design of the infrastructure of, of systems and processes necessary to operate in this emergency uh, uh, state that we are under. Um, and I'm gonna scroll through some of the highlights, but certainly want to invite our community to reference this in more detail if they're interested in learning about uh, the work that is happening in order to prepare to conclude the school year under remote conditions. Uh, as we've already spoken about, the board has kept student learning at the center of the way we have done our work and have cared about the connectivity of kids and families and employees throughout this time. That's been uh, just such a remarkable character trait of this, of this governance team. But let's jump into, uh, here's your table of contents and we'll start with our learning and performance update. Um, as you know, there has been a responsibility to redesign how we conclude the school year under remote uh, academics and remote conditions. So uh, there is a complete academic administrative decision guide that is now available on the district website. That academic administrative decision guide will provide details on how we're closing out the school year with grading, class rank, valedictorian, salutatorian, promotion retention, and also begin to talk about how there'll be opportunities for learning recovery. As we think about participating in academics in this fourth quarter, it really remains a very important aspect of the instructional calendar. But for students who are not able to do their best work, there will continue to be recovery opportunities uh, in July and heading into August and September. And so each of our schools will be providing more detailed guidance for families with detailed questions. Um, our summer learning recovery opportunities are outlined as well as how we will use uh, extended day, Saturday school and fall intercession as we return to operations in the fall. I'm really recognizing that we believe that uh, access to an education is vital and students uh, need the opportunity to show mastery of critical and essential skills and knowledge during this time. 
If I move forward with some of the work in our academic environment, I do want to uh, point out that while many of our uh, teachers and our resources have successfully gone to remote uh, learning environments, our K through three students have had additional instructional packets that have been provided by the um, and, and available for pickup at the curbside meal pickup locations. Uh, that does include some uh, printed books as well as instructional materials for work activities for families to take with them. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that in each of our academic areas, our special education and students served with a 504 continue to be um, addressed with the services provided uh, by the teachers um, that are assigned to provide those services and uh, continued questions related to special education services are best directed to the teacher and the principal as we um, support our, our learners in special education. Um, and then finally, uh, we've been able to celebrate so much remarkable work and currently are hosting the Art of Hope Digital Art Exhibit and Henry Moo's Family Fitness Challenge. So we would encourage you to just get yourselves involved in, um, in sharing with our community some great learning that can happen at home. I'll transition to technology and some of the big changes from the briefing provided to the board uh, just a, uh, two weeks ago include the opportunity for broken devices or devices that are not operating uh, properly to be uh, repaired. Uh, the best starting spot for a student or family who needs to do that would be to contact the local school principal to facilitate that through our technology division. Um, and then in addition, we've been able to maintain a very high rate of engagement for students um, and a very high access point for our students and our employees. In our operations division, we've been able to continue some of the construction work that is occurring outside of school facilities. And we have completed the deep cleaning sanitization of every school facility, every district facility and every school bus. In uh, family and student support services, we have continued to provide and actually grown the number of IEP meetings that are held um, online and provide services, including specialty services to students while at home. Uh, there has been a tremendous effort to support our families and students who are um, have house uh, living insecurity and, uh, and food insecurity and providing a wealth of opportunities for, for students to get access to Wi-Fi, instructional packet, uh, packets, food boxes, and laptop chargers. Uh, finally, we are uh, increasing our language services that are available to students who do not, uh, students and families who do not speak English as their home language. Um, additionally, I'd like to mention that as we move toward our finance uh, update, that our, uh, we, we will speak more to this later, but we are learning more information about our CARE Act, which is the Federal Stimulus Act passed by Congress and signed by President Trump on March 27th, how that will impact our district. And we've also been able uh, to continue our food service program at six schools throughout the district. If you actually look at the number of students who have been served, we have served now more than 66,000 meals in 10 days. And you can see the increasing numbers each day. We started out with about 2,000 meals a day and we're now nearing 11,000 meals a day that we are uh, distributing. Um, we also want to draw a special attention to a category titled essential spending. Uh, pursuant to the Henry County Board of Education Emergency Resolution and Declaration adopted on April 2nd of 2020, this is where any emergency spending that is a result of um, managing this response will be documented. And you can see two items documented for, um, for the public's awareness, the printing of K2 resources and the additional purchasing of Chromebooks so that we can facilitate a replacement plan for any student with a damaged Chromebook. Our school leadership uh, division continues to work diligently to provide all of the um, details related to end of school activities and events and how we will begin to facilitate the opportunity for our staff to have access to the building and provide personal belonging pickup for students. So all of that is in development and we will continue to release uh, each plan as it is completed. 
In human resources, we've actually now yielded 475 new applicants using our virtual job recruitment strategy. Uh, the human resources was featured in a national publication on the virtual job fair and the effectiveness of hiring. Um, we are uh, continuing to fill vacancies at the school level and continue to partner with our local colleges and universities to ensure that uh, uh, graduates who are ready to teach are choosing Henry first. And then finally, uh, in our chief of staff division, of course, communications could never uh, be more important than it is right now. And so the first of all, opportunity to produce this briefing is really a reflection of staying as transparent as possible with the public on the work that has to go into designing the system as we close out the school year, but also other ways that we are communicating uh, via the infinite campus messaging system, social media, the website and school websites. And then finally, uh, I wanna end our conversation with just uh, highlighting several positive and inspiring headlines that have come during this time. Now, what's really remarkable is that uh, we see just such uh, amazing outpouring of talent and support and acts of kindness. And uh, in case you hadn't had a chance to catch some of these things, uh, the Art of Hope digital art exhibit featured a student at Ola High School, and uh, that was on Fox 5 uh, over spring break. We had a student from Timber Ridge Elementary featured on the Weather Channel as a kid scientist. Um, in our Ed Week magazine, Two of our uh, members of the team, uh, Missy Morris and Brian Blanton were featured in, uh, in this transition to remote learning and the role that Henry County's uh, work has played as a national model. Of course, Shaquille O'Neal visited our first graders and that was featured uh, on TMZ. And uh, our virtual job fair was featured in a national publication titled Industry Dive. Our McDonough Middle School teacher, Mel Melanie Kellum, had an amazing performance in one of her lessons that got captured on the news. And uh, Unity Grove teacher, Katherine Wilson, sang a pretty cute song uh, that from the Trolls movie that had everybody uh, nominating her for the voice. Um, and then finally, Operation Lunchbox um, was uh, featured and the many, many different uh, restaurants and uh, uh, food providers that volunteered their services during our spring break. And so another uh, grat expression of gratitude to Chris Tucker Foundation and David Newman, the uh, CEO of Operation Lunchbox. Uh, Mr. Chair, that does conclude my briefing uh, during this emergency contingency time. And I turn it back over to you and I remain available for any discussion. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Does any board members have any uh, questions or comments for Dr. Davis on C1? Dr. Nutt? There you go. There Dr. we go. Matt. Okay. I just wanted to let um, uh, everyone know that the lunchbox at Locust Grove Elementary was amazing. Um, people were coming in, grabbing the food, um, thanking us. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with Southside Church during spring break and that people didn't miss a beat. They were still coming. And so thank you, uh, Southside church and everyone that was involved in that because I know at Oakland they were busy they were just swamped with people coming and getting their lunches and so was Hampton uh, so it was it was just amazing to see the community come out um, and one um, and the, the kids were just so appreciative so yes it was it was great and thank you to all of the uh, cafeteria people that gave up their time to come out and make sure their babies were fed and taken care of. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Knott. Any other questions or comments from board members on C1? Ms. Pope? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Davis, I just wanna thank you and your team for your quick and thorough response to this. It has truly been amazing and as it unfolds um, and the time has lengthened I'm just amazed at the hard work that has gone into making this such a thorough plan with with no detail um, left unaddressed so thank you for that and thank you for the transparency for our community um, I'm especially grateful that our 
organization has taken the time and the money to print the instructional materials for those K through two students that need them. I think that is so important and um, ensuring equity for all of our students. So thank you for that extra effort as well. And then I just wanna encourage um, teachers and paraprofessionals during this time last month, I don't know, I don't know how long it's been anymore. At one of our previous meetings, we, um, we discussed the importance of a smile upon your children entering your classroom and what a huge difference that makes. And I just wanna encourage teachers during this time that that smile is probably more important now than it ever has been. Um, and truly with all of the, the stress and the pressure that parents and grandparents and guardians are feeling, those students need that, that sweet welcoming smile from you more than ever. So I just wanna thank them for their, their work and um, ensuring that our students still feel comfortable and safe and secure in their new learning environment. So um, I'm just blown away at how all of this has unfolded and I'm really grateful to be a part of this team. Thank you, Mrs. Pope. Ms. Edwards. Thank you so much. I would just like to give kudos to Dr. Davis because this was like thrust upon all of us in such a small moment of time and nobody saw it coming, uh, weren't really prepared for it, but we worked through it. And I just say kudos to you and thank you so much for all the hard work because I know Dr. Davis, you had to have some sleepless nights. I kept encouraging you to get some rest. Um, I also want to thank our district leaders and our staff members for, this, um, for the remarkable job that they're doing and they've done in the past and the commitment to ensure that our core beliefs remain a priority for, our, for student learning. I also, I want to give appreciation out to our partners um, for stepping up and joining the district and, making, and meeting the needs of the community, our teachers, um, just everyone, the teachers, I want to thank them for their part for the Google Classroom and remote learning. Um, everybody just jumped in and just start doing their part and all of this came together to, to meet the needs of our students and, and to have 95% of our students signing on every day was just a really phenomenal. So hats off to everybody just joining hands to make this a remarkable period of time uh, when it did not when it probably did not have to be, but it was. And I am so grateful as a board member to say, I wanna thank everybody. I also wanna say kudos to our clinic aides and the nurses as well, because we all have worked very hard. And I know Dr. Davis is probably putting more hours than any of us. And I wanna thank her team as well, because I know she's been working and they have been working as well. And that's why all of this has come together so so peacefully and peacefully in, in such a remarkable way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Edwards. Any other questions, comments? Ms. Cobb? Yes, thank you. I just want to express my deep gratitude from the bottom of my heart. I wanna say thank you to Dr. Davis and everyone on her team and just um, from our teachers in the classroom all the way up through superintendent, just I was blown away just looking through the information that we just uh, covered in preparation for this meeting and just the amount of work that have gone into ensuring that this is successful for our students. It's just amazing to me. Um, and I just wanna say thank you for um, being so thoughtful about how this is gonna be carried out. Um, I just, just was blown away by the detail and the thoughtfulness that went into preparing this so that our students can continue to be successful. And uh, I just want to say a, a special thank you to our teachers. Um, you all are always hardworking, but my goodness, the amount of time that you're having to spend now to ensure that your students are learning. Um, just know that I, and I can speak for the other board members, I'm sure, uh, just say thank you so much for all that you do every day. Uh, please know that even though we can't see you in person right now, we are so grateful for you and everyone who is supporting you, uh, because I know that it takes a, a strong team to make things happen. And I'm so grateful that we have the best team here in Henry County. 
Um, I also want to say a huge thank you to Operation Lunchbox too and all the other partners in the community who really did help pull off a miracle last week feeding all those students and uh, my son and I actually had the opportunity to go to Stockbridge Middle School uh, during spring break to help serve some of those students and just the parents that came through the line were just so grateful uh, to have that availability to, you know, to have a meal. And they said, you know, they were so excited to just get to leave the house to come there and pick up food. So it's just a great experience. Thank you to Dave Newman and Operation Lunchbox and everybody who helped all the churches and businesses and restaurants. And we do have the most amazing community and I'm so thankful to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cobb. And I would just like to echo really what everybody said and just uh, instead of just narrowing it down, just literally just throw a blanket over the entire Henry County and just thank all of our employees, all of our community partners, uh, our parents who have become uh, teachers inside their houses. I know uh, with jobs, that's uh, not uh, ideal, but just literally just thank, just thank everybody. I mean, I know uh, it's redundant, but I mean, that's just what all we can do right now because as a, as a board member, knowing what type of tight knit strong community we have just makes our job uh, so much easier. And there's just so many wonderful people that work uh, across uh, our school system that are just able to make this happen. And I just wanna uh, say thank you. And I also, as I was listening to everybody speak, I also wanted to thank, uh, if anybody's listening, the taxpayers who believed in the Board of Education's vision years ago to approve uh, in our East Bloss program, the purchase of all of these computers. So all of our students actually has a device at home. Um, I wish we had a crystal ball and could know when things are happening. We didn't know that this necessarily was gonna happen, but Henry County was ready for it. And we are on the forefront and we are uh, leaders in this new innovation. So uh, I want to thank all the community members who supported that and just thank thank everybody. So with that said, uh, we'll move to C2. Our, oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Edwards. Yes, I just want to mention a couple of things and thank you. Um, am I muted? Okay. Dr. Davis, I know in, uh, when you were talking about your um, doing your informational item, COVID-19 academic operation, operations. Would you just elaborate on um, the technology? You said some, you mentioned something about the technology would be repaired and replaced. So could you just mention, just expound somewhat on that? Uh, two things on the technology and also um, the, also in the, the information that you presented, you talked about the Google Classroom and I did see it there, but just in case some parents missed it, could you just elaborate on the, the uh, virtual classroom uh, the teachers are using as well as the, um, the technology, please, replacement? Yes, thank you, Mrs. Edwards, for the opportunity to uh, underscore the uh, newly developed process to provide a replacement device for any student who has a damaged device or who had left their device in, in the school building uh, before the closure occurred. Um, and the best first step is to report that need to your local school principal who can coordinate with uh, Dr. Brian Blanton and our technology services division to actually uh, ship, may, we're gonna mail out the device to, um, to the student directly. Um, and really when we were initially closed for two weeks um, that we knew that there were some students who were uh, having limited access because of a broken device or because the device was left at school. And so coming right out of spring break, that plan was made available and we've done a couple prototyping pieces with that plan this week and it's now ready uh, to be activated for our students in grades three through 12. Um, and I think your second question is really about the nature of remote learning or the nature of virtual learning for our students and teachers. Um, and of course, in our K-3 environment, we have a lot of variety and uh, teachers making touch points with families with phone calls or email. And uh, occasionally some classes are able to convene as a class with uh, home devices. 
but really the 312 environment is where our one-to-one -one exists and teachers are able to facilitate um, synchronized, synchron synchronized instruction. Um, there's a lot of models that are currently uh, really in play that a student might experience, but you pretty commonly see teachers recording their instruction and then making it available electronically for students to view at a time that's convenient to them. And then teachers are creating class hours where either the whole class comes together for some instruction uh, via not, not the Zoom platform, but a platform like this. Um, or it's like an open dialogue, question and answer time, come when you need help getting through some of your work. Um, so there's a lot of varieties of ways that a student can engage with the different uh, teachers throughout their day. Um, we are not following the exact schedule that a student may have followed in person in a school building. Uh, schools have modified those schedules so that there is a designated time to be digitally engaging and then a designated time to be more independently working or, um, or connecting with a teacher based on need. Um, and so I, I think everyone's finding a little bit of a different rhythm and, uh, and principals have been uh, involved in actually instructional walks, which means going into a virtual classroom and, and providing some coaching to teachers who are now often very new in this environment. And also principals are involved in collaborative planning still. So teams of teachers still getting together and principals still walking through what does your instruction include this week? What are the challenges? What barriers do we have to remove for students? And how do we um, make this a productive standards focused week to keep on pace as the school year um, concludes. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? All right, we'll move on to C2 or March uh, 2020 financial report by Mrs. Willis, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Christy, Wilson, um, Christy Willis to present informational item C2, our March 2020 financial report. Uh, Ms. Willis. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board and Superintendent Davis. With this temporary new normal, I am pleased to be bringing you the March financials, which does um, conclude 75% of our fiscal year 2020. So we're focusing first on the general fund, which is home to those daily operations, and looking first at the revenue and expenditures, not only for the current period of March, but also for the budget year. The yellow highlighted percentage on the far right re reveals revenue just received is 84.52% of the budget. And we've collected more than 99% of our local sources, which is largely made up of the property taxes. And those um, collections are concentrated in those two months of around uh, November and December. Moving down to the green highlight, expenditures are approximately 1% under budget at 74.05%. Looking at the next slide, it's also the general fund, it's the balance sheet of our assets and our fund balance, or commonly referred to as reserves. We ended the month of March with assets totaling close to $100 million. This fund balance will gradually decrease through the next quarter and into the first quarter of the fiscal year 2021. Then we'll see that influx of property taxes um, around November and December, and that will boost that fund balance or reserves back up. Taking a broader look at all funds on the next slide, the cash on hand does total more than 236 million at March 31st, 2020. So we'll now move to the fourth slide, which is specifically our East Blast expenditures. We'll start first with East Blast four, these expenditures for the current month, which is the second column from the right, include a final payment on your investment of our bus fleet. The balance remaining for East Plus 4 is about um, just over $60,000, and that is for four um, instructional improvements. Like all public funds, once the items are received and invoiced, payment will be made. This last slide I have for you today for the March financials includes the East Blast 5, which definitely has more activity as that's our most current East Blast. These collections began in January of 2018 and will run through December of 2022. And they're on track to meet expenditures. The second column from the right reflects current month expenditures of almost 3.5 million with the most of the expense related to our new Performing Arts Center and our school renovations. 
Dr. Davis, that concludes what I have prepared today. Thank you, Ms. Willis. Mr. Chair, that concludes what we prepared, but we remain available for any discussion. Thank you, Mrs. Willis. Does, um, does any board member have any questions or comments on C2? And I just want to remind everybody that window is very small, so to make sure your hand uh, goes in front so I can see it. So is there any questions or comments? Ms. Mrs. Uh, Riddle, our parliamentarian, I'm actually, with Ms. Willis joining the screen, I'm actually uh, down a board member. So could you, uh, if, if Dr. Uh, Nutt has a question, would you please let me know? I don't believe that she does. Thank you. Any other question? Any other questions or comments from board members? All right. We'll move on to uh, C3, our March 2020 construction port report uh, from Mr. Malcolm. Dr. Davis. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'd like to invite Mr. Malcolm to the screen to present informational item C3, our March 2020 construction report. Mr. Malcolm. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Davis. Uh, the first item I have for y'all today is the construction report for March uh, of 2020. As everyone is aware, school activities at facilities were suspended March 13th due to COVID-19. At this time, it was decided that construction activities involving interior renovations to existing facilities would be paused as well. This included, but was not limited to, interior punch list work for groups 8, 9, 10, McDonough High School and McDonough Middle School, tie-ins to existing facilities for the addition of the multi-purpose facility at Eagles Landing High School, Hampton High School, and Stockbridge High School, and interior renovation work involving Group 11, uh, Locust Grove High School, Locust Grove Middle School, Bethlehem, New Hope, Rock Spring, and Tessahaw Elementary School. I am encouraged to report that construction activities have continued for projects that do not involve interior renovation, renovation work at existing facilities. These projects are the Henry County Schools Performing Arts Center at Fairview, multi-purpose addition to Stockbridge High School, Hampton High School, and Eagles Landing High School, and the Group 11 project, the, uh, the, specifically the multi-purpose addition and Strings Room addition. Uh, now, I'll provide a, a brief update for each of these projects, starting with the uh, Performing Arts Center. Uh, as you'll see, uh, we're really into the finish stage work now with that project, exterior, fine grading, installation of landscaping. We've put some additional sidewalks up there at this point. Uh, we've started to clean off the, uh, the parking lot. So we're getting into that finish mode up there. Masonry activities have been completed uh, to include the clean of exterior brick. Roofing activities have uh, been completed, uh, except for the roof trim and flashing, which is currently ongoing. Uh, installation of curtain wall in front of the building is ongoing. Glazing has begun and we're actually getting close to finishing that. Uh, and then dropping down to some of the finished work include installation of countertops in the dressing rooms and restrooms, ceramic tile installation, wood panel, uh, installation in the auditorium and painting at back of house. A seat setting of the uh, plumbing fixtures has begun. Uh, sprinkler piping activities continue. Uh, completion of ductwork, RTU startup, uh, lighting is finishing and finally stage rigging. Uh, we are nearing completion with that. So you'll see we're getting really close to the uh, Performing Arts Center. We hope to uh, do a substantial completion maybe in the month of May is what we're thinking about now. While we were able to continue with construction up there, we have some of the stuff that was coming in slowed down a little bit, but uh, they kept working. So we felt like we kept a good, pretty good schedule and we're now looking for some time in May to, to potentially do a substantial completion of that facility. Uh, moving down to group 11, current activities again are only exterior at this point, meaning the multi-purpose addition and the uh, strings room addition. So CMU placement and multi-purpose ongoing at the connector and exterior walls, uh, exterior and in interior semen placement nearing completion for the strings room addition. Uh, roofing installation has been completed for the multi-purpose addition. Uh, hanging of steel joists at the connector of multi-purpose uh, currently being done. We've completed the other uh, structural steel uh, for both of those additions. And finally, spray foam activities uh, for both strings room addition and multi-purpose addition uh, are ongoing and we've, uh, we've just about to start brick in that area. Uh, and then of course, MEP continues for both of those. Uh, moving down to the uh, three multi-purpose gym additions, firstly, Stockbridge High School. Uh, we continue to prep for slab board. And I think we've actually done a slab board at this point up there. Erection of structural steel, if you've been up there recently, it is ongoing and they're getting to the detail work with that. So you can really see it starting to come together and we're doing some underground uh, rough end work up there. Uh, moving down to Hampton High School, uh, we've completed the drying out of the building pad and actually the building pad 
uh, construction is nearing completion for that one. Uh, waterproofing for foundation wall is almost complete. Demolition of existing retained wall has been completed and we continue to do footing work at Hampton High School. And then finally at Eagles Landing High School, demolition of existing ramp has been completed. Footing work for the new ramp has begun. Backfill has been completed for the new stage. Uh, we've continued, we've started to do some framing at the high roof parapet and masonry activities have begun at the north wall for Eagles Landing High School. Moving down into pre-construction, we are continuing with our pre-construction services. Uh, we do currently have the uh, renovations, modifications, and additions uh, for the existing Performing Arts Center out for bid. We did a pre-bid uh, on 416, and we will bid that project 430, and I'll bring it to you guys for approval. And then finally, into post-construction, we're still working through some uh, closeout and punch lists for groups 8, 9, 10, McDonough Middle, and McDonough High School. Uh, Dr. Davis, that completes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Malcolm. Mr. Chair, that concludes what we have prepared, uh, but we remain available for any discussion. Thank you, Mr. Malcolm, for that presentation. Does any uh, board member have any questions or comments for Mr. Malcolm or Dr. Davis on C3? Mrs. Edwards? Uh, thank you, Mr. Malcolm, for that information. Um, and I would like to ask Dr. Davis, um, I noticed over in the Fairview community that work really never stopped over there. And I noticed that uh, Mr. Malcolm has uh, mentioned other sites where work was uh, was continuing during this pandemic. Um, so were there any um, measures in place to ensure the contractors followed the CDC guidelines during this pandemic? Uh, Mrs. Edward, thank you for the question. And uh, when we first transitioned to remote learning and remote operations, the shelter in place ordinance and the governor's executive order were not in place. And so the continuation of work did not uh, cause a response for us to have any unique requirements, except they couldn't do any tie-ins into existing uh, our current existing facilities. When the shelter in place ordinance was uh, established and the um, governor's executive order was, uh, was, uh, was issued, then uh, we went through an essential employee and essential work uh, process to evaluate the nature of the work and evaluate the uh, conditions of the company who was providing that work. And so uh, the companies themselves governed their responsibility to follow CDC guidelines along with the executive order. And, um, and we maintained a pretty high threshold for the type of work that we were um, going to proceed with, uh, especially in those shelter in place conditions. So uh, we've, we've had a process to evaluate that and we have had verification from companies that um, they are operating within uh, their boundaries, but it has been on their responsibility to govern that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Edwards. Uh, are there any other comments uh, or questions on C3? All right, hearing none, we'll move to the next uh, item on our agenda, which is C4 or FY21 budget development uh, by Mrs. Willis. Dr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'd like to invite Ms. Willis to present informational item C4, the FY21 budget development. Uh, Ms. Willis. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Well, good afternoon again, Mr. Chair, members of the board and Superintendent Davis. So, I wanted to start with the first slide as we go to that um, after the coverage, JD, if you'll go one more. So this is a slide that you're very, oh, I apologize, go back one, I'm sorry. So this is a slide you're very familiar with. And my ultimate reason for showing you um, this slide today is the compass in the background. And we often speak of your core beliefs and commitments and the plan of action and the strategic priorities and the plan to be a compass or a guide for our work. As we navigate the COVID-19 pandemic, the compass has not changed. Our journey may look a little different, kind of like our delivery of instruction and our delivery of meals to students looks a little different right now. There is strength and security in your compass. It will guide us through this pandemic and our future work as a school system. 
including our budget. The general fund budget, which is our topic for today's discussion, relies on state funding determined during the legislative session each spring. The legislative session was suspended on March 13th. And while we do not have any definitive state revenue figures or when the session will reconvene, we would like to provide an update on projections. Looking at the first column of numbers and taking you back to last month's budget presentation, we discussed maximizing state revenue with the incredible efforts of cross-divisional work and schools to ensure where students, excuse me, to ensure um, students were reported as they were being served. In addition, the legislator was in full swing and we gave revenue estimates of the governor's proposed salary increase. We also discussed our local economy's strength and due to the growth of the property tax digest, we would lose state revenue by way of the local five mil share and equalization grant. In March, we also brought you a budget overview with a potential decrease in state revenue of close to $12 million. As a board, you have guided our financial stability for our core business of student learning. Continuous community feedback lent to key budget priorities of personnel investment, instructional focus, and a supportive, safe, and secure environment for our learners, staff, and the entire Henry County Schools community. Today, our world is totally different than from that March board meeting. And yes, the FY21 budget and future budgets will be affected by this pandemic. The last column now reflects what our state revenue decrease may resemble if the legislative pauses on the governor's salary recommendation. The teacher's retirement system or TRS decrease is the employer cost. And since the state does provide TRS funding on state allotted positions, there will be a revenue decrease for the lower employer cost. There will also be a cost savings on the locally funded positions that fall under TRS as well. Because items such as local five mil and equalization are calculated on previous year's tax digest, these decreases will remain the same. We are estimating our state revenue to decrease close to $20 million in FY21. While the general fund's revenue stream is 99% state and local revenue sources, shifting from a state funding level to a federal level is necessary as our nation and world are in unprecedented times. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security or CARES Act passed by Congress and signed into law by President Trump on March 27, 2020 allocated funding to support school systems response to the COVID-19 pandemic. While the federal application is yet to be sent to state departments of education, so states may apply for the funding, as a school system, we are already coordinating these funds to continue your commitment around excellence in public education. A cross-divisional CARES steering committee has been organized to gain an understanding of this act, work across all divisions and schools to support the prioritization of funding to your core beliefs and commitments, develop accountability processes related to the act, and provide oversight to support reporting requirements. Henry County Schools has, provide, excuse me, has been provided an estimated allotment from the Georgia Department of Education in the amount of $6 million. We do not have a timeline as to when these funds will be made available, but we do know the funding can be used through September of 2021. This funding can proactively address distance learning, school meals, supplemental learning, at-risk student populations, and mental health. Through our end of the year process guide for students and families and the instructional and operational continuity briefing which were developed using your compass, we will continue with our core purpose and responsibility of student learning. During these unprecedented times, the word stability kept coming to my mind when I thought of how you as a governance team have approached the budget. 
Synonyms for the word stable include uniformity, strength, security, and dependability. Your readiness for uncertainty has prepared us for these unchartered times. I know it's not customary to include Dr. Davis in the presentations. However, as we spoke of her journey as superintendent and the annual budget, I knew as part of the governance team, she should take the lead on this slide. Dr. Davis, I turn it over to you. And uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, I want to take a moment to um, just really reflect on our journey as a governance team. Um, when I think about that journey, I think about your expectations as a new superintendent uh, here in Henry County Schools uh, in November of 2017. And at that time, it was clear that you expected of me to evaluate, examine, and improve our business operations, efficiency, and financial effectiveness. Um, it was clear that you were interested in ensuring that dollars spent by this Board of Education resulted in student learning outcomes um, on the rise, and that it was important to you that we would be very reflective of our historical spending trends and make certain that our business operations were modernized. So as we look at this slide, I think this is actually a moment to acknowledge that the COVID-19 is certainly creating uncertain economic terms across the state, the region, and the country. And of course, Henry County will not be insulated from that. But what Henry County's Board of Education has done over the last three years is prepared a stable budget that has, uh, is, is going to be capable of weathering such storms. First, it was clear that the deficit spending pattern needed to be stopped. And we had an elimination of the reserve spending in the fiscal year 2019 of $12 million. We also had a reallocation of services and personnel from district levels to schools during that time. In fiscal year 2020, there was an emphasis on improved systems and processes so that the student reporting efforts would yield the dollars reflective of the services being provided by each of our schools. Through better accounting metrics and state reporting metrics, we realized a new $3.1 million in our state revenue. At the same time, our budget was growing, so this board was committed to an investment in our general fund reserves and last year dedicated $2.5 million of that new revenue directly into the reserves. Parallel that moment, the state health uh, program had a benefit holiday of $839,000 for Henry County. That was in June of last year, and we, we were able to take that state benefit holiday and add that to the general fund reserves commitment that the board had already made. Now well over a $3 million investment in our general fund reserves just last year. And, and not just that, it has been important to our Board of Education to continue to maintain our reserves at a high percentage. State law requires between five and 15%, and we've always been near the top of that percentage of reserves requirement. I also want to point out not only to the board, but to our community that during this time, we have consistently had decreases in equalization and local five mills because the local economy has been strengthening alongside this. We've become accustomed to mitigating that decrease and simultaneously making new investments. Now, of course, the uncertain conditions make it a little more uh, realistic to acknowledge our new investments and, and some of the new uh, next generation work that we see as necessary might need to be a little delayed. However, the opportunity to maintain our workforce and remain committed to our employees heading into FY21 uh, remains possible because this Board of Education has had a lens of stability in the most recent years. It's an opportunity to say we don't have to get ready for an economic uh, challenge, we have stayed ready. And, uh, and, and as we begin to uh, learn more about how the uh, Led General Assembly reconvenes and we learn more about the governor's budget, we will be able to have a more agile response 
to those conditions. Um, Ms. Willis, that's all I've prepared. Let me turn it back over to you to conclude this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Davis. The last slide that I have for you tonight and in conclusion, we would like to give you an update on the budget calendar. A shift to presenting the tentative budget on June 8th and a final on June 22nd will afford time for us to align with state revenue commitments to public education once the legislative session does reconvene. In addition, we will continue to work with tax, our tax commissioner and tax assessor to estimate our local economy's impact that will in turn affect the local revenue sources. Your compass will continue to guide our work and to build a budget around your core beliefs and commitments. There is no doubt the FY21 budget will look different than what we had originally planned. Our entire nation and world are in uncharted territory. I appreciate you as a board providing our foundation of stable and fiscally strong budget practices as we navigate this pandemic and its impact on our budget. Dr. Davis, that does conclude what I have prepared today. Thank you, Ms. Willis. Mr. Chair, that concludes what we have prepared, but we remain available for any discussion. Thank you for your presentation, Mrs. Willis. Uh, does any board member have any questions, comments uh, for Mrs. Willis or Dr. Davis on C4? Mr. Chair, Dr. Nutt does have a comment. Okay, Dr. Nutt. Do I need to... Dr. Nutt, you remuted yourself. I'm sorry. We'll get this right in a minute. Um, I have two, I have two, well, I have a question. One, the first one is for um, uh, Dr. Davis. Uh, Dr. Davis, so with our budget, and I, I know we probably can't answer this question right now, but I'm hearing a lot of concerns from the teachers that we may have furloughs next year. Um, or the next com the coming up school year um, is and I, of course I have told them and which is true we have not talked about this this is not even on our radar at this time but is there any way you can maybe bring some closure to their concerns or yeah uh, thank you Dr. Nutt you know the entire state is talking about lots of cost saving metrics and all of our brains resort to what we experienced many years ago in uh, an effort to balance budgets. Um, we have not spoken of that as a plan uh, heading into next year. Uh, we of course do not have our state revenue dollars uh, clearly articulated for us. So it would be wise for me to acknowledge the responsibility to build a balanced budget, but that the board has actually positioned this organization with some stabilizing factors that we wouldn't have been able to say a few years ago. And so um, it is, of course, a priority of this board to invest in employees. It's a priority of our community as came out in our community conversation. And we will uh, certainly keep that in the top of mind as we move into preparing a balanced budget. Thank you. Um, my next um, question comment is for Ms. Willis. Ms. Willis, um, um, my question is, I, and I, I hate to even bring it up. Will we are we starting to work on the splash, um, splash six now? Um, because if we are, I would really like to have an item, or at least let's talk about bringing our custodians back under the umbrella of the Henry County Board of Ed. I know right now there's, we can't afford that after looking at what you just presented to us, but is, isn't there any way maybe we can do step by step or at least let this, these people know that they're on our radar and we are talking about them? Thank you, Dr. Nutt. I don't think that they've ever been off of our radar. Um, uh, you and I were both in, in at that time when we had to do what we had to do. Um, yes. Unfortunately, it was the rising health insurance costs and things of that nature. I will tell you that SPLOS dollars are being discussed. However, currently by law, those dollars are not allowed to be used for uh, salaries. Okay. So we would need to look to the general fund um, for, for that. 
I know one of our problems with with having them employed with us now was we just don't have the equipment. Um, and to be honest, by now, what equipment they had back then probably would be outdated and needed to be replaced as it is. Would their equipment be able, could we, if we decide to do, would their equipment be able to be tagged for the SPLOS 6? Uh, yes, ma'am. If it's deemed to be capital in nature, um, like other SPLOS, it, it, it potentially could be. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Knott. Uh, Mrs. Edwards? Thank you so much. Um, uh, Ms. Willis, on the um, on your doing your report, I was looking at the screen and I noticed, um, did I interpret this right to say the salary proposal that the governor had placed out there earlier has kind of dis has disappeared because of the pandemic? We are making an estimate, um, Ms. Edwards, that that probably will not come to fruition. That is something once they reconvene. We do know that I believe, if I'm saying this correctly, what the House recommended um, to the Senate right before everything stopped was actually different than what the governor's recommendation. So we kind of just took the approach of that may not be in the budget's in the governor's proposal or the um, legislative's proposal once it's finished. But again, until they reconvene and we see kind of what they're asking for or what they're doing. Okay, we're making and I have, okay, I have another question. Uh, would you have any idea in what manner the um, $6 million through the CARE uh, funds, how they would be coming into the district? It's my understanding they'll be coming through the district just like other funds would through Department of Education. They'll be the ones that house it. And so it looks like the federal uh, Department of Education is working with all state Department of Educations to get their application in. And then it will trickle through Department of Education or what we like to call as the dough, trickle down through that. Okay, so I'm assuming and correct me if I'm wrong, it would not come in in one lump sum, but it'd be distributed periodically? Uh, portions. Based on my historical knowledge, it's probably gonna be more like a reimbursable type grant that we have to submit the information or a budget and then we get it on a monthly. But again, until they decide, we're not sure, but I highly doubt it'll be all available at one time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Edwards. Any other questions or comments uh, on C4? Mrs. Cobb? Yes. Ms. Willis, I just want to say thank you to you and your team for all the hard work that's gone into um, preparing the budget this year. I know it's been a challenge, and I just want to say thank you. Um, and I am grateful that we are adjusting our uh, budget calendar because I really wanted to ensure that we do have the time that we need to have these very important discussions uh, because I know we all take this very seriously and the budget's definitely not something we wanna rush into. So I'm, I'm glad to see that we are adjusting our timeline for that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cobb. Any other uh, questions or comments from board members? All right, hearing none, we will now move to C5, school calendars for 2021-22 uh, and 22-23 uh, by Dr. Knowlton, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Let me invite Dr. Knowlton to present informational item C5, school calendars for future years. Dr. Knowlton. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board and Madam Superintendent. During the March board meeting, calendars for the 2021, 2022, and 2022 and 2023 school year were presented for your consideration. As a reminder, both calendars are comprised of 178 student days with school starting midweek in August. And the last day for students is prior to the Memorial Day holiday. All current breaks are reflected in these calendars as well as uninterrupted teacher work days. However, board, after further collaboration with you, we went back and added in conference days into both calendars during the month of October. These early release days will be used to facilitate face-to-face -face and or virtual 
parent-teacher conferences. No actions are required of you at this time. These calendars will be placed out again with the conference dates reflected for public review and comment. Dr. Davis, that concludes what I prepared. I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Knowlton. Mr. Chair, that concludes what we prepared, but we remain available for discussion. Thank you, Dr. Knowlton. Does any board member have any questions or comments on C5 for Dr. Knowlton or Dr. Davis? Uh, Dr. Nutt? Well, if I quit unmuting myself there, um, why did we not uh, do a conference day uh, aligned with the, um, the um, report cards? with going out to report cards. It seems like to have three days all together, if I was reading that right, why would we not space out those three conference days? Um, Dr. Nutt, I think I might chime in on that and just um, mention that that window is essentially so a teacher could schedule all students on their class list, um, through that time period. So parents would have some options and the teacher would have some flexibility to do that scheduling. And it would fall after the first nine weeks um, reporting, uh, reporting moment. So we wouldn't do it at every nine week increment, just that first one. Any other questions or comments on C5? Ms. Pope? Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know how appropriate it is for me to jump up and down from my house right now, but I love this. Um, I, this is something that I believe strongly in, an opportunity for the teachers and the parents to have an opportunity to dialogue. Um, I, I think this is wonderful. So um, thank you, thank you so much for this information. This is really, really exciting. I did notice that it is for, um, it says for, K through ninth. Um, do we have any intentions for what 10th through 12th graders would be doing during that time? I think there are probably some wonderful ways that we could use that time for them as well. Yes, ma'am. We actually have our 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. We have the graduation coaches and the counselors are actually be working with those students that are that may be having need having some academic needs as well. You know, and if I could add to that, I'd also think about how amazing we could have a commitment to college and career readiness activities and really elevate the uh, systematic experiences students have in those years to those post-secondary um, options and how their academics play a role into that. So I think there could be some real opportunity in those upper years as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for that update. I'm really excited about that. Thank you, Mrs. Pope. Ms. Edwards? Yes, thank you. I'm just glad to see that we're back to um, 178 days. I remember when it was 180, then we uh, went back, I think about 175 or 174, but I'm just glad to see that we're back up to um, 178 days of school, of seat time. Thank you, thank you Mrs. Edwards. Uh, Dr. Nutt, did I see your hand? Okay. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Knowlton or Dr. Davis on C5? All right, thank you, Dr. Knowlton. We'll move to uh, C6, our annual code of conduct, conduct review by Mr. Schrom, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'd like to invite Mr. Kirk Schrom to present informational item C6, our annual code of conduct review. Mr. Schrom. Good afternoon, board chair. Board members and Dr. Davis, I'm pleased to present our Code of Conduct for review. Our review process aligns with our board's commitment number three, that all school learning environments will be supportive, safe, and secure. This also aligns with the board's expectation for continuous improvement as outlined in the plan of action. As I begin, I want to take the board back to last spring. During the review process, the Code of Conduct underwent major revisions. The revisions were designed to increase consistency and create a document that had credibility and clarity. As a result of previous work and revisions, our code of conduct for the 2020-2021 school year includes minor modifications and adjustments in design based on our continuous improvement cycle. 
Our continuous improvement cycle included receiving feedback from multiple stakeholders that interacted with the code of conduct. This included all of our assistant principals, our superintendents, student councils, student advisories, including elementary, middle school, and high school, teacher advisories, principal advisories, and in addition, we held a focus group with our bus drivers. We received feedback from parents and students who were involved in the code of conduct process and from our school attorneys, and also from observing how our code of conduct impacted our schools. Through this process, a couple of themes emerged. The first were areas in which we needed to strengthen our consequences and potentially add new language, and the second areas where we needed to increase flexibility, but still ensure consistency amongst our schools. On this slide, you will see some highlights that indicate where those themes are reflected. First, as vaping became a significant health concern, and from our community and board members' feedback, we added a section for the Code of Conduct for Vaping Offenses. And as a district, our Family and Student Services Division also worked to educate parents and students to the dangers of vaping, so it was important that our Code of Conduct reflect the seriousness of this public health danger. We also strengthened consequences for bus misconduct. And based on feedback, particularly from our school administrators, we added language to ensure that schools are implementing preventative measures to support students, revise the formatting, and ensure consequences were age appropriate. Board members, as we have presented our revised code of conduct, this will now be placed out for public review and comment. Following this process at the May 11th board meeting, the code of conduct will be recommended to the board for approval. And throughout the summer and following school year, ongoing professional development will be provided to school administrators to ensure understanding and consistent application of the code of conduct. Dr. Davis, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Schramm. Mr. Chair, that concludes what we have prepared, but we remain available for any discussion. Thank you, Mr. Schramm. Does any uh, board member have any questions or comments on C6? Ms. Cobb? Yes, Mr. Schramm, I just wanted to say thank you for the special attention that you all have paid to the vaping epidemic. Um, and especially the problems that it has created in our school system. Um, I know that I expressed my concerns to you all uh, months ago, and I just thank you for um, just listening to my concerns. And of course, you shared the same concerns, and I appreciate that. And just the action that has been taken by you and your department to ensure that our students are uh, protected from this. And so I just um, am grateful for the response of you and your team uh, to address this dangerous epidemic that's not just in our school system, it's you know across the world. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful that our students are uh, gonna be hopefully protected at a greater level because of your action. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cobb. Uh, any other questions, comments on C6, Mrs. Edwards? Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to ask Mrs. Strom, um, what is being, how are earbud buds being addressed? Um, they can post a security safety hazard, uh, academic, they can, children, students can, when they sit up in the classroom, of course, they're not listening to the teachers if they have those earbuds in. So how are we going to address the earbuds issue? When I walk into the, some of the schools and at times, and they're walking down the halls, they have them in their ears, you know, they have them in the ears in the classroom. So this could be posed a security problem as well as an academic. So how are we gonna address that? Sure, thank you for the question. Uh, along with our division working with uh, uh, Dr. Blanton's division on instructional technology and making sure our students, our schools, our teachers and our administrators understand appropriate use, um, and how to ensure consistency across our schools. When we see best practices, for example, of going into a classroom and putting a cell phone in a pocket chart um, that also provides security but allows the students to engage in the lesson, how we share best practices amongst our high school principals led by our assistant superintendent for high schools, and then working with the schools to ensure that those practices are pervasive through all of our schools. So that's what we're doing to address the earbud issue. Okay, I, well, I mentioned it because I know that there are a few schools in the district where 
they do have those place certain locations where they do you know put their cell phones and their earbuds and i'm thinking if it can be done at one or two schools it can be done throughout the district uh, one thing i would like to mention is that i would like to see the school administrators develop a kind of relationship with the students uh, so that they will listen to them they will pay attention to what the administrators are saying without any problems but that's going to be on the um, administrative, the leaders in the schools. That's going to be on them to make an effort to develop that kind of relationship with the students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Edwards. Uh, any other questions or comments on C6? All right, thank you, Mr. Trump. We'll move on to uh, C7, our comprehensive policy review. Uh, a through N by Dr. Knowlton. Dr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'd like to invite Dr. Knowlton to present informational item C7, our comprehensive policy review. Dr. Knowlton. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board and Madam Superintendent. This afternoon, I will share a brief six month update on the comprehensive policy review. As you are aware, this process started in November 2019 with eight sets of policies to review. And this policy overview shows the current status from the first six sets of policies. You, the board, have approved and adopted sets one through four. Please note that sets, set five is a business item on tonight's agenda. And set six, which is highlighted in purple, will be presented to you tonight as an informational item for your consideration and placed out for public review and comment. To date, the current number of repeal policies is 54, revised policy is 33, current number of policies that have not changed is 23, and there has been a total of two new policies. This is a summary of proposed actions to the sixth set of policies reviewed during this comprehensive policy review. We are just two sets or approximately 60 plus policies away from reviewing all eight sets of policies. We have had, you have had the opportunity to review this sets of policy and no actions are required of you at this time. As a reminder, the policies are arranged in the following categories. The first category is repealed or not required for reasons such as policy is outdated, laws have changed, or could, could be better displayed in a regulation or an exhibit. The second category is, remain, is retained with revisions. These revisions reflect changes in laws and or local practices. The third category is retain no change needed, which means the policy is sufficient in its current form. Again, this set of policy will be placed out for public review and comment. Dr. Davis, that concludes what I've prepared and I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Knowlton. Mr. Chair, that concludes what we've prepared, but remain available for any discussion. Thank you, Dr. Knowlton. Does any board members uh, have any questions or comments on C7? Mrs. Edwards? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Davis, if a parent looks at this information and want to, wants to gain more information or be enlightened on where they can find um, where the policy has been duplicated within another policy, or just like uh, Dr. Nelson has said, there's been changes or ch no changes needed or it's outdated, where would a, a parent be able to find that particular information um, regarding policies. If say it's, it's duplicated, where would they find it? If you say a policy is duplicated, where would that parent, if that parent wanted to go and look at the policy to see if it has been duplicated or if it was duplicated, uh, is there some way that parent will be able to find that information? Sure, th um, thank you. And Dr. Knowlton, why don't we tag team on this response because I know you've navigated a little bit of this. Um, as the board knows, you get a summary of each of the policies and the rationale associated with the recommendation and the opportunity to tie the recommendation to where the duplication occurs um, has been a part of the board um, packet. And then um, Dr. Knowlton, do you wanna talk just a little bit about uh, the community access to that or the parent access to that? Sure, Superintendent Davis. So what happens is a lot of times if parents have any questions and or concerns with that, they contact us through the public comment uh, email and then we can contact them uh, personally to give them any, to answer any questions that they may have. 
Also, what you're going to notice for the next series of, uh, of uh, policies that we place out, we're going to have more information so they can see or retain and they can see what the policies that repeal, they can see a little bit more information. But the answer to your question is basically if they have any parents, and we've had several parents already make contact with us in, uh, or stakeholders to make contact with us regarding questions, and we answer those questions individually. Yeah, so thank okay. you, Dr. Knowlton. I think in response to hearing a similar question, Mrs. Edwards, through public comment, the information and rationale that's been provided for the board will now be included in what's posted on the um, on the public review uh, tab of the website so that the rationale is viewable by the public um, as well. Thank you so much. Hey, Mrs. Edwards, any other uh, comments or questions on C7? All right, thank you, Dr. Knowlton. We'll now move into the next section of our agenda, which are business items for this afternoon, which means we'll be taking action on these uh, items at tonight's uh, regular business meeting starting at seven o'clock. Uh, so we'll move into D1, our Henry County Board of Education policies A through J, uh, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'd like to invite Dr. Knowlton to present business item D1 available for action in this evening's meeting. Dr. Knowlton. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board and Madam Superintendent. This afternoon, I'm presenting to you business item D1, Henry County Board of Education policies. These policies were presented during the March board meeting and placed out for public review and comment. As you can see in your package board, there were limited comments made in regards to this set of policies. Please note that we followed up with each of them. Also allow me to remind you that many of the policies that are being re recommended for repeal will be replaced with administrative regulations. Dr. Davis, I believe this item is now eligible for the consent agenda. This concludes what I have prepared and I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Knowlton. Mr. Chair, that concludes what we have prepared, but we remain available for any discussion. Uh, thank you, Dr. Knowlton. Um, does any board member have any questions or comments on D1? Mrs. Cobb? wanted to highlight um, it's letter E in this list of policies. It's IVDD, the gifted student programs. And as I was preparing for the meeting, I noticed that we had received um, some comments about this item in particular. And it seemed to me that maybe um, the public might have been a little confused about this policy because I know that it's Dr. Davis's desire, as well as mine, to actually expand our gifted program and certainly not eliminate it. So I just was um, hoping, Dr. Davis, if you might provide some clarity for any other um, member of the community that might have thought maybe we were um, trying to get rid of our gifted program. And I know personally that is the opposite of what we want to do here in Henry County. So. Um, would it be possible to maybe provide a quick explanation to those who might have um, maybe misunderstood what we were doing with this policy? Uh, absolutely, Mrs. Cobb. And yes, thank you for pointing to the public uh, comment um, concerns. I do want to mention that any public comment concern expressed is um, directly followed up with the stakeholder that has expressed the concern. But uh, you're right, our desire to grow the gifted education program and actually further invest in um, advanced learning opportunities for all students is a, a shared value and something we saw deeply coming through our strategic planning process that we were in the throes of. And so the real reason for this comprehensive policy review is to eliminate duplication that exists in governing authorities. And so we will now lean on the State Board of Education rule for gifted programs, which is was essentially duplicated in our own policy manual. And we will then write a reg administrative regulation that just outlines the process in Henry County to go through the process of gifted identification and services. Um, this will really be no change in the quality of services. Uh, fundamentally, we all believe that there is an opportunity to enhance that program in Henry County Schools. And so thank you for drawing that to the attention of this discussion. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Ms. Cobb. Any other uh, board member have any questions or comments on D1? Does any board member have an objection for um, uh, D1 being placed on tonight's consent agenda? 
All right, seeing none, we'll put this on tonight's consent agenda and move to D2, our K-12 transportation alert in information system. Dr. Davis. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'd like to invite Mr. Malcolm to present business item D2, K-12 transportation alert and information system. Mr. Malcolm. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Davis again. The second item I have for y'all today is the proposal for the K-12 transportation alert info system. As you might recall, during the transportation update that was presented at the February 10th study session, a slide was shared labeled continuous improvement of transportation services. This slide outlined no cost, minimal expenditure, and long-term investment areas. Concerning the long-term investment area, Synovia Solutions has been selected for the K-12 transportation alert info system. This system will allow for updated GPS, driver navigation, automated time and attendance, and a parent notification system known as Here Comes the Bus. Total annual cost for the system will be $166,219. The previous GPS system included in the annual transportation budget amounted to $95,828 for the 2020-21 school year. So in effect, this will be in addition to the budget of $70,391 annually. The agreement will be for one year with the ability to renew for up to four years. The Transportation General Fund budget will be used for this. Synovia Solutions will provide installation of the system and ongoing maintenance and technical assistance. Installation will begin as soon as possible after board approval with total installation of all components completed by September 1st to include the parent notification system. Dr. Davis, this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Malcolm. Mr. Chair, that concludes what we have prepared, but we remain available for any discussion. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Malcolm. Uh, Dr. Nutt, did I, do you have a question or comment? Hold on, Dr. Nutt. You're... This is awesome. I can hear the parents now. Um, I know where my bus is. I know where my child is on the bus. So am I correct, um, Josh, um, Mr. Malcolm, that this will be part of, um, it will inform the parents of if their bus is late or where their child is. Is, is this the type of system that we're getting? Correct. So the, 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 uh, the part of it, that here comes the bus application will be that. So. When, okay. As we get closer to total implementation of the system, we will be sending right. information out to parents and other. Oh, this uh, is wonderful. Yes, to uh, guardians of the children, so they can fill it out, and then they can have on their phone or computer an application that will show where the bus is in the route. So if if we do have a bus late, they will be able to know where the bus is on the route at that time. So yes, that is what Here Comes the Bus is. And, and again, that's a part of the overall system that we're getting from Synovia Solutions uh, through this. This is, this is awesome because this is what so many of the bus drivers and the parents too have been asking for. And um, I'm really surprised at, at what our cost really is after you look at turning everything is and our, our, call, our ending cost. This is we should have done this a long time ago. It would have served a lot of headaches and a lot of parents will be very, very happy to know where their child is and which one. Right. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. I know this was not easy. I know it was um, something that you really had to dig into, but we really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nutt. Any other uh, board members have questions or comments on D2? Mrs. Edwards? I do, thank you. So I just want to ask Mr. Malcolm a question. I'm looking at the yearly base price, 174, right? Yes, ma'am. And, and the, the yearly equipment trade-in, what's the trade-in? So that is the previous GPS system that we had. So we will trade that equipment back in and over the life of the five years, we will receive that credit back. So the total amount annually will be 160. 6,219. But then, as I mentioned a little while ago, we also currently pay for a GPS system. So this will replace that GPS system as well. So really, we'll only have to update the budget for this line item to $70,391 annually to give us the updated GPS, the uh, driver navigation, automated time and attendance, 
and then the parent notification system known as here comes the bus. Okay, great. This is this is awesome. Um, in fact, I didn't realize we had a GPS system. So that's why I'm asking well, what was the trade but in. It has not been updated in eight years. So uh, oh my. This, this does that as well. So it will truly help not only the parents and of uh, the uh, the children, but our transportation department as well. It's time that we updated some of these components uh, in that department as well uh, to help us better be able to inform the public. Oh, absolutely. So I guess my next comment is, is it was outdated. Am I, am I correct? It, it was, it, we had and a GPS, did, we had why, a GPS system, but it was, uh, it has outdated. not been updated in eight years. It was outdated. Yeah, okay, yes. <laughs> it was outdated. <laughs> and, and I'm just wondering what, I, I just won't even ask the question. Thank you. I'm just glad to see that we're, it's being updated. Yes. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Edwards. I will say that. Thank uh, you, Mr. Malcolm. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Edwards. I will say that, I, in my experience, um, all tech, uh, technology is outdated when you leave the store with it. So, but I am, but I am glad to see that uh, we're getting this. That's a really cool feature, and I'm, I'm curious to see uh, how it works. And I know it'll for those uh, cool mornings or uh, rainy days. I know the parents and uh, students. Um, does any other board member have any questions or comments on C2? Oh, I'm sorry, D2, Ms. Pope? Yes, um, I just want to echo what you just said. I think this is really great. Um, I think it will provide a sense of, a further sense of security for our bus drivers and our parents and guardians. So um, I'm, I think this is a wonderful thing that we're able to implement in our transportation and I'm, I'm excited for the parents' response to this in the fall. Thank you, Mrs. Pope. Any other questions or comments? All right, this item is eligible for tonight's consent agenda. Does any board member have an objection? All right, seeing none, we'll place this on tonight's consent agenda as well and move to D3, our digital camera system for our school buses. Dr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'd like to invite Mr. Malcolm to present business item D3, our recommendation for a digital camera system for school buses. Mr. Malcolm. So, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Davis, one more item for me tonight. Uh, it is the proposal for the digital camera system for school buses. Again, as you might recall, during the transportation update that was presented at the February 10th study session, a slide was shared labeled continuous improvement of transportation services. This slide outlined no cost, minimal expenditure and long-term investment areas. Concerning the long-term investment area, IBS Incorporated and their Angel Track system has been selected for the digital camera system for school buses. This system will allow for updated security cameras for all buses within the fleet. Total cost for replacement of cameras will be $662,792.26. SPLOS 5 transportation funds will be used for this item. The RFP was posted 226 with a closing date of 326. We received nine total RFPs for review. The evaluation team studied the proposal from 327 through 41 with IBS Incorporated being the recommendation after scoring was completed. Currently, the eight-year-old system provides one camera on our special education buses, two cameras on the 72 passenger buses, and three cameras on the 90 passenger buses. This updated system will allow for five cameras on the special education and 72 passenger buses and six cameras on the nine passenger buses. Installation of these cameras will begin as soon as possible after board approval with completion scheduled by August 2nd, 2020 or the start of the new school year. Dr. Davis, this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Malcolm. Mr. Chair, that concludes what we prepared, but we remain available for any discussion. Thank you, Mr. Malcolm. Uh, Man, I, I'd like to say that's a that, that's awesome that, that we're getting that much uh, increased camera activity on the buses. Special Ed, you said one to five, and seventy-two passenger two to five. Correct. That's that's awesome. What? Um, okay. Does any uh, does any board member have any questions or comments on D three? I'm not seeing any. All right. Uh, this item is eligible for tonight's consent agenda. Does any board member have an objection? All right, we'll place this on tonight's consent agenda. And thank you for that, Mr. Malcolm. 
We'll now move into our next section, which is thank you. E. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move into our next section, uh, which is uh, E, executive session. Do I have uh, a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of litigation, student discipline, and personnel? I have a motion for Ms. Cobb. Is there a second? A second from uh, Dr. Nutt. All in favor of going into executive session for litigation, student discipline, and personnel, please raise your hand. All right, we'll now go into executive session and be out momentarily. Thank you.
All right, Mr. Hinton, we're back up. All right, thank you, Mr. Harden. Um, do I have a motion to come out of executive session? I, Dr. Nutt has a motion. Is there a second? A second by Mrs. Cobb. All in favor of coming out of executive session, please raise your hand. All right, well, now we're out of executive session. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes that the superintendent read in executive session? Dr. Nutt, with a motion, is there a second? Mrs. Pope, all in favor of approving the minutes read in executive session, please raise your hand. All right, minutes approved unanimously. We will now uh, adjourn the study session and we will reconvene uh, at seven o'clock for our business session.